sharing. So, um, so just a little bit of, um, well, I guess I'll, I'll, you'll get my little train of thought as, um, as I go through this, but so here is my intro. Uh, again, my name is Teresa Makwa. I've been working with FileMaker since 2007. Uh, with version 8.5. Uh, I co-own Profile Developers with my husband, Thomas, uh, and he's been working with FileMaker forever, um, about the same as Beth, what, 30 years, something like that. Um, and then we have our little blurb here, um, and that's me in the little computer. So hello from me. Uh, so my presentation today is just a little demo of uh, Web Viewer um, with some related data. So what happened was <clears throat> a couple months ago, um, I was taking a portal with notes in it and changing it to be shown in a web viewer and uh, wanted to interact with it. And I hadn't done that um, either in forever or just couldn't remember how to do it. Cause you know how you, uh, as you develop, you run into things that uh, you, know, you can't hold everything in your head. So you run into things where, oh, I have to go relearn this technique and go look up all of the um, resources, look up all the information and kind of stumble your way through it until you get the end result that you want. And so while I was uh, doing that and going through that process, I thought, oh, the easiest thing in the world would be if there was a demo file out there that just had this already done in it and then I could just look at it and reference it and you know copy and paste and or move things around um, but there wasn't so this was my kind of um, uh, not really an attempt because it was successful so this is my effort to document that workflow uh, and hopefully you know when this is done we can put this file out there and somebody else out in the world can use this to help them, um, you know, work with this technique. <clears throat> so this is my cheesy title that uh, is very simple. Web viewer notes made easy. So this is just a method to display related data. Uh, this, the table is gonna be notes using a web viewer. Uh, as it says here, no special techniques are required, just a little patience with wrapping simple HTML into a display calculation field. So here's my concept description. We've got a database that manages projects and all of their related data. In this particular demo file, there's one field in the, you know, and or two fields in the project table. It's got an ID and a name. Um, and then there's a related table for notes. Uh, the idea, or what our client wants, is that multiple users will add notes into the system across multiple projects. And it's very important that all users can do all the notes entered by each other. And it's important that users not be able to edit or modify other users' notes. So uh, this is a very simple relationship, project to note using the ID field, simple one to many. <clears throat> And if you are, if you were a beginning FileMaker user, uh, you might just make a simple portal, right? And so with FileMaker, as we all know, you click and drag your portal and it's gonna create these single lines. And uh, if we're thinking about our clients' needs and, and what they requested, uh, so right now we can see the notes, um, but uh, we can't really see all of the notes. And another fun thing about FileMaker, um, in order to see everything that's in the text field, you have to click into it in order for it to expand to show you the field contents. So if the contents of the field extend beyond the field boundaries on the layout that you're on, you know, it'll, it'll open up. Uh, so we already have a problem because uh, we, while some of these are fine, so if your content is going to be very short notes, that's great. This might be a useful layout for you. But if you have anything more, you're going to run into some problems. 
Um, so one of the other requirements they had was to include, you know, the name and the date so you could see who made the notes and when. Um, but now we even have less space as we did before. Uh, and if we said as a beginner, well, what's something I can do here? Maybe I can uh, make these, you know, read only so that nobody accidentally clicks in it, forgets what they're doing, and then selects all and deletes the contents. Um, uh, you know, we'll make these not enterable. So uh, we'll try this as a tooltip. So now these are all, you know, read only. I can't click into them. Uh, but if I hover, you know, I see the created by Larry, I got the timestamp, and then there's the content, but this is not an efficient way to read your notes, right? Nobody wants to do this. And besides, the notes disappear after so many seconds when you're looking at them. So, so this is while it's providing the information that uh, the client wants, um, it's really not doing the job. So um, what might be the next step? If you were starting out here, you might try a taller field in the portal. And that might help, that might get you more information, right? But we still have the same problem. Some of these are not big enough. And so if you are in this situation, where you want to be able to see all the notes. They are of various lengths uh, and content. And you don't want to have page, you know, these gigantic portal rows that you're dealing with. You might want to try a web viewer. So with a web viewer, <clears throat> we can look at this list of all of our notes uh, and it's very flexible. It shows everything nicely. Uh, you know, there, there's no fields here. So we don't have to worry about the size of a layout object that um, does not change dynamically while we're looking at it. All right. So what we've done to create this uh, web viewer is, and I'll jump into layout mode for just one second. So our web viewer <clears throat> is simply uh, this little text string here, data colon text slash HTML comma, and then list of this calculated field that I call ZCHTML display. And I have one because I have another one that we'll see in a minute. The calculation is extremely simple. <clears throat> So in this field, and I know I don't even need the let statement right here, um, but uh, I started with the bigger one and then scaled this one back, <clears throat> excuse me. So in our let statement, we've got our note, we've wrapped the get a CSS around the note text, <clears throat> which is that note field. And then we simply hard code a little bit of HTML around the uh, fields that we want to reference. So um, if anybody's, <clears throat> and this is another thing about uh, HTML. So I know um, enough about HTML just to get in trouble. Uh, I would not consider myself a web expert in any way, shape, or form. Um, and every single time I have to do anything with any kind of HTML or web anything, I have to go look it up all over again because my my brain cannot retain um, all of the little bits and pieces because there's a lot. <clears throat> but this is very simple, just a paragraph, you know, bold around the timestamp. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I've been battling a dry cough for like three weeks, so. <clears throat> Then we have italics around the created by, and then we have our note. Uh, and then the HR is the horizontal rule. So that's what causes that break in between the items. So simple, simple, simple. So then, um, so then what happens is our client says, oh yeah, I forgot. Um, we need attachments on our notes too. 
So we're going to have to have a way to add our note text. Um, and then everybody's going to have the ability to add, um, you know, one or two files to it because that's their standard, right? There might be an email that they want to attach. There might be a uh, spreadsheet that's relevant or pictures. But in this situation, they want to have a text field and add some supporting files. So let me drag some stuff in there. So I'm just going to throw some templates in there and save it. And so in this web viewer, we don't see those fields. Let's check out the next one. So in this web viewer, we have the addition of links to those container fields. Um, <clears throat> and there is a calculation in the uh, this field here, this calculated field for the HTML um, that rolls in the extension of the file. So these say view PDF because there's PDF files. This one says zip. Uh, this one's an RTF, XLSX. So <clears throat> this calculation is a little bit more complex. So if we look at this one, <clears throat> this let statement has broken out all of the different pieces. Uh, so we've got our created by, which is straightforward. Uh, this link style thing we'll show you in just a second. Uh, then we've got the FileMaker Pro version number, which is important to include. Uh, we've got the anchor link for the buttons, because what we want to have happen is when you click on those links, it's going to open up that file in a card window for you to then, you know, do something further with if you want to have your users, you know, be able to export it or what have you. Um, <clears throat> we have these these two lines here, the file one ext, file two ext. Those are grabbing the extensions of the files. And then the button one and button two uh, is putting together that, that uh, anchor style, the quote of the link, which is up here. So again, I'll talk about that in a second. And then the reference to what this button is supposed to do. So what action is it going to take? All right, so um, down here at the very bottom is where it puts everything together. So again, we have bold around the creation timestamp, italics around the created, We've got our note, and then if there's a file in file one, it shows the button for file one. If there is a file in file two, then it shows that button. And then it puts the horizontal rule, right? So we can see all that. Um, <clears throat> further in here, uh, I have the results of the first calculation versus the results of the second calculation. Uh, so you can see how this one Calc one is real small, calc two, same thing, but then we add the, uh, the href and we see FMP19, HTML notes demo, that's the file name. Here's the script, the parameter, uh, and then that's the one for the second button. So depending on if there's one or two um, files in the note record, depends on how many buttons show. So you can just kind of get a get a sense of how this is building the uh, this display calculation. Uh, also in here, I have the current protocol for the FMP URL and and, and the example down here. So this is uh, what you'd find in the FileMaker help. And these are all the different pieces that could be included in the FMP URL. So that FMP XX, that's your version number. And again, the version number is super important because um, especially for us, because we have uh, four or more different versions of FileMaker on our computers. So when you are using, if you're using a file, uh, say you're using something in 18 um, and you're putting in an FMP URL call in there, 
and you don't designate the version number, whatever the default is on your system is going to be the one that it opens up. So, um, so that's why you want to code it to the one that you're in. And, and that's why in my calculation, I get the application version as opposed to saying strictly 19 or strictly 18, because the environment could change. And this kind of just guarantees that whatever version you're working in this second is going to be the one that opens. Um, down at the bottom here, our example, I've kind of broken out uh, because I know HTML is kind of hard to see <laughs> and hard to read. So the file name, which is, you know, part of the call here is right there in that href. And then the script name is here. So it's a very simple script, this FMP URL view note. And that has two instances in here because there's two buttons. And then the parameter that is fed back to FileMaker with the script name is the ID of the note. So that's exactly the same on both of these buttons because, because of the structure of this database, right? So the note has the two, con the two container fields in it. Uh, so they would have the same ID. If you were using a system that had the file attachment separate, then you could have a whole list of those and they would have their separate IDs potentially. Um, uh, you know, there's so much, so many ways that you could that you could do this. And then what I did was I put a uh, pipe one at the end of the first one for the button one and a pipe two at the uh, tail end of this ID so that in the script, this FMP URL view note script, it says, oh, get the script parameter, break it into, you know, uh, replace that pipe with a return, get value one as the ID, get value two is which container I'm, I'm opening up. Um, and then it goes with that. And then the note data that we are seeing, uh, this kind of makes sense. You see the breakout of the creation date, the who, the note, and then those ID fields. So that's what belongs to the note record. Okay. So, so we've got these buttons here. So if I click on view PDF, uh, and this just very simply opens it up in kind of a viewing window, uh, this can't do anything else. Um, it's just showing us this. <clears throat> but one thing that um, I did that I thought was <clears throat> potentially useful and a little bit fun uh, was to make build in this thing uh, like a button styler because um, it's fun if you can, um, you know, make your links into something else and maybe match your color scheme or whatever you want to do. Uh, so I just built this simple little button styler. And the idea here is um, that we can view uh, the, well, let me, I'll do it this way. So I'll show you the styler. So in this card window, the button styler is super, super, super simple again. Um, so there's a table for the button styles and it has these simple fields in it. And there's this little preview area, uh, web viewer. So you can come in here and add new or create, whoops, or modify what you have in here. And it just gives you kind of a little playground for um, working with this. So we can make these changes and we can close it. And if we switch, you know, it just, everything just changes. Um, and then you can clear them if you want. So, but the idea here is that we have a fun little button thing that we can play around with. The button style relationship is set up here that we've got two global fields in the node for the button selector that's, and it's looking at that nickname field. 
So those would be unique. Um, and they could be, uh, you could use something else completely, but I thought this was a very simple way to set this up. And then uh, let's go back to this. So the link style in our field calculation is looking at the button preview, right? And the button preview is another calculation. And I think I did not put that in here, <clears throat> but real quick. In the button styler, the button preview is another calculation where, if you guys can see this, uh, you know, it's just stringing together those fields um, as if it were an HTML, uh, you know, just, just as its own little style. So uh, that was what I thought was a fun little thing to play with um, and a simple way to introduce um, some interactivity into the web viewer. So like I said, we, we've done the, you know, showing stuff in a web viewer, do that all the time. But the extra interactivity of, uh, you know, being able to edit something if you were the user uh, you can kind of see how extensible this is and how many things you could do. And then with the button styler, it kind of uh, allows you to extend things graphically. You could put anything to link to as a style and kind of enhance this kind of web viewer um, situation, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So um, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything about any of this stuff or want to see anything in here? Because otherwise the next uh, what's my next one? Oh, yeah, I already showed this. Because um, otherwise I can move on to some extra info. Yeah, and I did have one question, Teresa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when you're getting like the text of the note, you're put using the get as CSS function. Mm -hmm. Are you just using that to make sure make sure you preserve whatever formatting or whatever that was included when the note was originally entered? Is that why you're doing yes. it that way? Yeah, yes, and that's one of the reasons why I made some of the text, you know, red and uh, something else here blue, you know, just to just to show that you can retain the formatting by using the get as CSS. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Everybody else good? <laughs> so, uh, so this, like I said, we've seen the button styler. Uh, so some extra info here. Uh, you want to make sure you check your extended privileges. So by default, no accounts have the FM, uh, should be, yeah, the FM Earl script extended privilege enabled even the full access one. So uh, you want to enable it for any accounts that'll need it. Otherwise they'll get an error that they can't, uh, they can't use the command when you hit the button. Uh, the next thing we have here are some URL resources. So the first one I have up here is the W3 schools, um, just because that's where I go whenever I'm like, I don't remember how to do that. I'm going to go look it up. Um, and if you haven't gone there lately, they've expanded everything greatly. They are now, they've got like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, PHP, they have got all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and they've like updated their site and it looks really nice. Um, and I love how they uh, have those little kind of uh, try this kind of tutorial style things um, baked in to all of their pages. It's very nice. Uh, the next one, oh, and in, in this, when this file's shared, these are all, um, you know, baked into the button with an open URL. Uh, then there's the Claris help. So this is the, you know, standard uh, one where, and if I pull that up, just to show you guys what that one looks like. Uh, so this is the same 
piece of uh, info that I had on the screen earlier that talks about the format of the URL, but this gives you know lots of information about um, what you can do in these examples for the URLs is useful. Uh, and then the last little resource we have here is our own Tony White. Uh, so he was one of the ones, he comes up very high on the list when you do a search for FMP URL, <laughs> anything. So um, he's got this page here with some historical context. Um, and this is where I think I found in the, uh, that, that the uh, version number is very important because I kept, you know, first time I'm going through, I'm playing around with the interactivity and I'm like, why is 16 opening? What the heck's going on here? So I actually read it um, and then realized what I was doing wrong. So um, this year, the strict formatting of the URL can be difficult to debug. So um, plan for lots of testing just in case. And then because we're using a web viewer, you want to keep in mind that there are character limits. Uh, so for Windows using IE as the default browser, and I don't know if on Windows, we're not huge Windows users over here. So I am not 100% sure if um, IE is still set as the default browser by, by default <laughs> on all the Windows machines, or if they have opened that up, um, you know, or if people are automatically powering up their Windows machine and changing their default browser immediately. Um, but they have a very, very small uh, character limit, that 2083. So if you are trying to feed back, um, you know, strings of IDs or um, image information or something else uh, back to FileMaker, you could hit that limit. So that's just one of the things you want to keep in mind. Uh, on the Mac with Safari, it's 80,000, a little less of a concern. So this is my last slide. So thank you for listening. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, you can email me anytime at Teresa at Profile Developers. And that's my little thank you, thank you. And uh, again, if anyone if anyone has any constructive criticisms or anything, uh, if you think that there is a glaring omission, uh, something that I should add to this, uh, please let me know. And I would be happy to incorporate uh, something in here you know, before we put it out into the wild. Okay, but thank you um, guys. I, hold on, I, th I yeah. thought that was a really, really good presentation. I try really, really hard when someone's doing a presentation to come up with at least one constructive criticism, mm -hmm. but you, you really made it tough. Good. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I would do, which is <clears throat> since HTML is white space aware, mm -hmm. um, in, in the node, the calculation that uh, represents HTML, I would throw in two carriage returns just so that the code visually maps. Um, like I said, I'm scraping the barrel. I thought it was a really good presentation. The, <laughs> um, and, and, and high technical content too. The um, very timely, uh, on one of the discussions, there was a conversation, someone else, not me, discovered a bug, dare I say, uh, in the get as URL encoded feature where six characters that are on the URL, oh gosh, what's that thing called? The request for comment specification. There's like nine characters that are supposed to be encoded okay. and FileMaker misses six of them. So I just dropped a custom function and a link to that um, for the people on this call and for anyone who's listening, get as URL dot polyfill, wanted to use the word polyfill, fancy word, uh, which basically, um, picks up the six characters that FileMaker mixed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you happen to be passing some data around that contains a colon or quote mark, exclamation, mm -hmm. and three others that I forget, but they're all caught and that's on the brand on the site. Anyway, terrific presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I think you're up, Beth. Oh, darn, I thought I had the night off. <laughs> So, wow, I, I have to say that was really wonderful. I love that. And it's going to be a real tough act to follow. You can all just log off now because this is not going to be worth watching. Oh. But uh, <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> okay. So 
Let's see, I have to share my screen, I suppose. All right, I'll move my little palette over to another window. <clears throat> okay. So my presentation, I don't have a lovely PowerPoint or anything like that. Um, I just have a database file and I'll talk it through. Um, so as a consulting company, we're creating estimates all the time for our customers. And I don't know if you all experience this, but I'm guessing most of you do. Um, every time you go to produce an estimate, you, there's a lot of stuff that's the same every single time. Um, and then there's a certain um, area, you know, your user stories or your features that you're delivering to this project. Those are the things that are changing. But there are certain things, you know, that are always the same. You don't want to forget um, to include them. And you also want things to look nice. So, you know, over the years, processes change. We've done everything from, you know, Word templates that you start with and you fill everything in over and over again. Sometimes Excel templates that do some calculations so you can, you know, put in how many developers and how many um, hours per week you're going to work. And so it can do some math for you. All different ways of doing it. And as our team has grown, we've realized we need to be more consistent in how we build our estimates for the work that we do for our clients. So um, I got tired of all the different tools and I just said, well, I know FileMaker, so I'm gonna make my life easier for doing estimates. And I shared it with my group and they liked it. So this is probably what we're gonna be doing to build our estimates going forward. It's still a work in progress. It's not completely polished, but it's a, a good start. So that's the background and we'll dig in. So main menu, right now I have two choices. I can show my estimates or just start from new if I know that I'm doing something brand new that I've never done before. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, say, show my estimates just so you can kind of see this a little before um, before I, I go through it. So it brought up one record showing me work in progress. Um, that was, that's the title, okay? If I were to clear that out, you can see it says enter company name. That's uh, work in progress is, I should say company name. Just, uh, or we'll call it FM Berg. That's my company tonight. Um, and the project title is, demo of estimator app. And it tells you here, add the client's logo on the reports tab. So if I wanna do that, I can, um, I can do that later. So I'm gonna say right here, we're just, this is where you put paragraphs of stuff, right? You just, here's, here's the, who did we talk to? Who contacted us? What do you wanna do? Um, you know, as many paragraphs as you want. What I would like to do in the future, um, and maybe some of that HTML will come in handy, is um, make this a little more formatable and pretty. Right now, it's literally I can do paragraphs and tabs, and of course, you know your standard color or font size, that sort of thing, and, and it'll show. But you know, like bullets and indenting, none of that happens automatically, but it's still useful. So I've got a bunch of tabs here to kind of walk me through the process of setting up an estimate. In our discovery phase, you know, there's always the initial stuff. We always have our kickoff meeting and then we identify who all this, the stakeholders are and who's allowed to make scope changes and, and all of that stuff. And we review logistics on, you know, where's your server? How do we get access? Do we need a VPN? All those things. Um, then we're going to wireframe your project and we're going to do some iterative stuff to make sure, you know, that you like the look and feel and the direction before we go build everything. And throughout that process, you know, we refine the project plan and we identify any external integration stuff if we're doing any APIs or plugins or anything else. So this is all kind of just like boilerplate stuff. And then we have a review check. Point. So the first part of any project we do is going to have a discovery phase. And by the end of the discovery, if you don't 
like it, you're not comfortable, we, we don't continue with the project and that's as far as you've gone. So we have some default numbers, you know, th these are not necessarily real numbers. Um, you know, we can play with any of these, change them to whatever we want. Um, you know, and obviously the math all works as soon as I make changes, you know, things show up here. And then the estimate is the stuff you're putting here is going to show up on a report that we're going to deliver to our client. Um, and the people doing the estimating are not necessarily the developers who are actually going to do the project. So uh, we have a dev notes section in here too, so that the person who's writing the estimate can provide some sort of note, you know, like, and you can tell if it's green that somebody has entered a note about wireframing. So I can come in here and it says, get the logo and match the color scheme of the website. You know, that's a starting point for the wireframing, just a simple example. Um, so there's that discovery piece. And then there's a manual hours. So when my boss looks at the estimate and says, I know you always take three times longer to do everything than you say you're going to. So this, you know, we're going to add 40 hours here because I know that you're, you're underestimating. You know, so it just upped the hours. Um, now, user stories, this is where you get into the meat of what the actual project is for this client and details of how to do it. I'm not going to put a whole bunch of stuff here, but um, let's see. I can use my index to pick some different items too, like, okay, data entry feature and I'm just gonna put sample stuff. And, you know, most of our user stories start with an authorized user will be able to, and then we describe what they're gonna be able to do. And then we put a number here that's gonna take 14 hours for us to build that. And I might put a dev note in here that says, you know, use X plugin, um, you know, whatever, some kind of notes that I'm thinking will make sense for this particular feature so that it's obvious to the developer how I envision that being built. Um, we can have, uh, you know, count module, basic setup, whatever, you know, you get the idea. Then we come to the next tab. We have some default project management things that we always say. And notice there's no numbers around any of that um, because that's gonna happen on a different tab because project management for us is kind of a percentage of the project and based on some different choices that we make. Uh, and then assumptions, there's no number around assumptions either. That's just stating things, you know, for the, the CYA saying, you know, we assume that the people we need are going to be available for the meetings and that you're going to do your testing and that we're going to have access to your server and all that kind of fun stuff. So these are just kind of boilerplate things and you can remove anything that you don't uh, want to have in this particular um, Thing, or you can add new stuff and add as many as you want. Okay, and then when you get into this page, this is what is driving the numbers around the project management. Um, so we're gonna assume one developer, um, let's change this. We're gonna need two developers on this project and an iteration is gonna be a two week cycle. And we're only gonna work 20 hours a week per developer to get this done. And when we have an iteration meeting, it's gonna take, it's not gonna take three hours. Uh, we're gonna be able to do that in one and a half hours. Um, and we're gonna do eight hours of testing in every iteration it's, and so on. So as you can see, as, as I've made these changes, my numbers have changed on what we're gonna do. Now here you can see my manual discovery hours. So that's this number from this tab. When I get onto costs, all the costs are here, right? The discovery hours are here. Um, 
the module hours are here. So there were my discovery hours. There were my module hours. Um, so those numbers are here. And then my PM hours are coming from the math that this all does, right? So it gives me my total, I'm up to 123 hours. And I think, oh, well, you know, if I wanna round that up nice and pretty, I'm gonna, you know, add two more hours. So I get to 125, whatever. Um, and then it's going to recommend a block size purchase based on the number of hours. So it rounds up to the next nearest block size. So there's the block size and the rate, and then it does the math for them. And then, um, or let me go back there for a minute, or you know, let's say I really overestimated here, I can take that out and you know, get down to a number that I wanna have. Uh, additional purchases, we break it into one time or recurring. Um, so you might need to get a new laptop, you know, whatever. Um, your additional purchases, um, you know, you might need Claris FileMaker licensing. Uh, let's say you're doing, you know, out essentials for five users. And I don't know, that's like $1,500 or something, whatever it is. Um, and that's annual. So, you know, you can have whatever you need. Um, attachments, if you want, you can um attach pictures you know maybe you did a mock-up already that you want to show or you want a sample of a different screen you did you could throw a wireframe or something in here um, and if you do you can include it on the report so this attachments is you can keep copies of the reports here as a you know stored pdf to show what you sent to the client or you can show things that you actually want to be an attachment as part of the proposal. Um, and the show button will indicate whether or not you include it on the, uh, the report, right? So I could stick a PDF here or any kind of research, but it's just here to attach to the project for me or the developer or internal use, or again, it can be something I want to show on the report. And then when you get to the report page, um, we have a place where you can pop in the client's logo if you have it. And let's see, where did I put those? I had some to do to do. I don't know where I put them. That's not it. Let me see if I can find them. Just had one a minute ago. Yeah, doesn't matter. I don't need to put it in there. I have other ones I can show you. So anyway, we can pop in a logo. Oh, I should have grabbed the FM Berg logo. That would have been smart, you know, and then I can say, okay, this is for Todd Weller. And it is being presented by Betlata. So now I've got all of this stuff filled out in here and I can preview my report and it gives me my nice cover page and when I'm presenting my document and it has, this is why the logo is useful because it looks kind of silly when there's no logo here. Um, and then we can look through the pages. Now this is still in FileMaker. So here's the overview, you know, and this could be multiple paragraphs. So it might go on for pages. And then here's all the discovery bullet points and the user stories and the project management and the assumptions and then the cost page that gives you all the details. And then it gives you an area to sign off and say, yep, move forward. Okay, now notice there's no numbers anywhere except in the cost page, right? 
So I'm going to close this and I'm going to change some options. Um, let's say I want to do a swag report instead of a statement of work. Okay. Um, that's what we call our sweet wild ass guess, which is a high level estimate where we don't go into as much detail normally. Um, and so if I do that, notice it now says high level estimate instead of statement of work. And then um, still have my sections here. Um, but there's no sign off on this and it is, um, it can be done differently. I don't have to put all the different sections like I do in a regular report. So it could just say um, project or, or um, proposed work instead of the different breakdowns. So I have, um, I'm in the process of creating a couple different types of reports. So based on which report type, it will show some different things. That wasn't the best example. Um, let me go back to my statement of work. Um, here I can show hours um, if I want to, and I can also show module groups. And um, I'm gonna preview the report again. So here, since I put the hours, now it's gonna show my breakdown in the major sections. So you know that this is, this, that can't speak. The discovery is 22 and a half hours. We probably would round that up. Um, the user stories are 26 hours. Though, and then notice because I chose module groups, it did, gave me a sub summary. So assume there could be multiple things in, in these groups. So you would have um, you know, a breakdown of what happens in each group, right? And I'm not sure why there's a stray thing there, but again, like I said, it's, it's a work in progress that shouldn't be there. It just means I didn't assign something properly. Um, so there's the report. Now let me just, oh, I didn't need to do that. Come back here. I'm going to choose to look at some different things because right now we're only seeing the one um, report that I just created. So if I say show all my stuff, I can flip through here and look at some of the different estimates I was working on. You know, so this is that new one we just did. But if we go into something else, you know, far more descriptive, um, has all the stuff in here. Um, now this one has some attachments, but none of these are things to show, right? This report's already been delivered. That's why it um, didn't show up when I first said, uh, let me go back here. If I say show my estimates, it only shows me this new one right here because I don't really care about the old stuff unless I'm looking something up for some reason. So um, that means my open projects are either gonna say new or in progress. And all of my stuff is everything, including delivered ones and so on. Um, okay, so yeah, these happen to be the PDFs showing the history of, okay, we sent a first draft and then we changed the proposal a bit. And now here's the final draft emailed, you know, with our information. Okay. Um, and let's see, here's an example of one that has some pictures, right? So let's look at if I preview that report, I'm not going to change my date. It also questions me if I have a report date that's in the past. It doesn't want me to change it for historical reasons unless I specifically choose to. So I'm going to say, no, I'm not changing my date. Um, but I still want to see my report. So that was supposed to, oh, it is, it opened it. It just opened it on my other monitor. Hang on while I find it. Come on, let me get it there. It doesn't like my multiple monitors. If you are going to have attachments, it's going to append a different page to the report um, so that it's all one PDF when you produce it. But this way you get to preview and see there are going to be attachments. Um, and let me just go back here for a second and put some text. 
illustrate how it will look. Okay, and then we'll just preview again. So it's real easy to keep making changes and tweak it to get it the way you want it. Bring that back over here. Oh, where'd that go? Oh, okay, see, that popped that out of the way. Um, so again, I have more tweaking to do, but so that went on to a second page, I'm sure, because I put too much text. But um, good example. That's why we debug. Okay, so now I just told it to create a PDF, which it put on my desktop. Desktop. So there's the file it just created and it keeps popping things onto my other screen. Let's bring it over here. And then you can see the single PDF with the attachments appended as well. Would look better if it was one page. Um, so there you have it. That is pretty much this lovely little tool. Um, it's a work in progress, like I said, but it's been very helpful lately trying to remember all the things that we have to remember and uh, try to put some sort of process around it. Any questions, constructive criticism, feedback? Uh, do you have a section um, I'm assuming you have kind of a template section for all of those items that are kind of default. Right. So when I say record. new estimate, yeah, um, it pre-populates with things. So there's just a table. I don't have a user interface around it. Um, but yeah, there's a default line items table. And so this is pretty much it. And I can configure that any way I want to. Um, you know, so here's the uh, the discovery items, the user stories, project management, and the assumptions. Um, and there's a kind of a number system behind things, right? Um, so that when we sort the report, discovery is always first, user stories are always second. Um, project management's a higher number and assumptions are nine, you know, because they're always at the end. Um, and there's room to grow in there for other categories we think of and come up with. And then there's even a sequence within those. If we wanted to rearrange the order that the um, items uh, came in. So it comes to this table, finds everything, sorts it, and then imports it into the, um, the project. Um, on that order of stuff as well, this is that order number, right? So if I want account module to be before data entry, I can make that a one and make that a two. And then um, if I preview that report again, now account setup is one and data entry is two. Very cool. Very nice. Thank you. I so, love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a work in progress. I've only delivered two real proposals using it so far, um, but it's definitely a whole lot less work than it, the process used to be. So, um, yeah. mine is uh, the, the one I did is similar. It's been existing for 15 years and it is nowhere near as slick as yours. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, the newer tools make it easier to build stuff. You know, we well, all had to do things the way we could back then. 
Um, the other thing to, let me see, where is it? Oh, costs. Um, the other thing I have in here as well, um, I was experimenting. This is, these are my default variables in a table that um, has all of my presets, you know, starting numbers. These, these are my examples. And then this is highlighted because it means I've put some features or I've, I've changed some numbers from our defaults. I'm not visually showing that here anywhere. I, I could, you know, because I, I know that this one I changed and this one I changed and so on. But if I want to set back to my defaults, I can just hit default variables and look at it and be sure. And then if I want, I can refresh it. And now my numbers are back to the default numbers. Do you share this with your other developers at IT Solutions or do you keep this to yourself? <laughs> well, I started out proving it for myself and then um, I hosted it for everybody. So I have one of our team who has started to use it um, and the others are all thinking about it. And my mm -hmm. boss loves it because he can go in and up my numbers. <laughs> And he can print it off and, and send it without me having to do it. So, um, so yeah. Very, very cool. Thanks. Okay, going, going back to uh, Teresa's uh, presentation, just a couple of things. Uh, I don't use the web viewer very much, but I believe in either 19.2 or 19.3, of course, it shifted from IE to um, EDGE. So there may be some different performances. There may be some different uh, behaviors. And that's something you might want to check. Second thing, um, the you're correct in saying that uh, it won't work without enabling the uh, privilege set bid for FMP URL. But uh, when you do that, you need to stop and consider if you have opened a vulnerability uh, to allow a user to do something that a user might not otherwise be authorized to do, namely run scripts. Um, so that, that would be something that I would recommend that you review about that. And there are several techniques that can be used to lessen the damage uh, that uh, an unauthorized uh, user might inflict. That is the reason why by default, I think starting in either version 16 or 17, 16, I think, FMP URL is off. Yeah, it's always always a good idea to have people, you know, opt in to that kind of thing uh, with the security vulnerabilities. I'll definitely add um, to either one of the one of the layouts or add another one to mention the security considerations and make sure that you know people have an awareness of it while they're looking at that demo file. Thank you. I, have a, um, I don't remember whether it's a white paper that Wim Decord and I did or whether it was on my um, FileMaker security blog, but we have uh, an entry in one or the other place that specifically talks about the uh, uh, these various APIs. And it's not just FNP URL, it's uh, Apple events, it's uh, uh, HiDiffX uh, on the Windows platform. And of course, now in the latest version of the product, they've added uh, one specifically for the plugin API. Okay, that, that'll be a good thing to um to link to on the screen that has the FMP URL um, that privilege set. So I can link to that at the bottom of that. That would be a good good resource. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. If you'll email me, I will um, I'll find that article and send it to you. Uh, sh Blackwell at Earthlink.net. Okay, thanks. 
So you can see Todd sent me the logo and look how much better the report looks with the logo on there. I think I'm still sharing my screen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one other thing to point out too, I did do a little adjustment. If you notice, there's a logo size here. Um, I did find that, you know, because I'm using limited space, sometimes some logos don't look that great. So I have an option here to adjust a little bit and I pick one of the two um, to see which one looks better. I'm probably gonna add a couple of additional options. It's just a bunch of um, fields on top of each other with, um, you know, hide when kind of thing so that whatever number you've selected, whatever criteria that has is the one that displays. Um, because you know, not every logo is horizontal and so on. And you know, some people have centered things and things like that. So I'm gonna probably add some additional options to make it a little more dynamic. <clears throat> How many hours do you think you've put in building the estimator app? Um, it's hard to say that because I kind of did it while I was writing real estimates. Um, so some of it was, you know, me just filling it out and then hitting preview and not liking how it looked. And so I'd tweak things, um, but probably two days, like 14 hours, maybe, maybe that's a little high. I lose track of time when I'm having fun. Right. Spoken like a true expert who's been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I never care how long it takes as long as I get it done. <clears throat> All right. Well, I guess uh, before we move on, does anybody have any other questions or comments for either Teresa or Beth? All right. Well, I guess does anyone have uh, one more thing, either something they want to share or a question for the group that we can maybe help answer? I just thought of one. Um, can we see the layout of the sliding report that I assume is for the estimate? Sorry, the layout for what? Uh, how are you building the final PDF? Uh, I'm curious to see if it's see the layout in FileMaker or what else you might be working with. Oh, yeah, no, it is. It's all native FileMaker. Um, let me put that back up. <clears throat> it is just a simple, normal layout. This is an area too where I want to learn more about, uh, you know, maybe doing web viewers or something. Um, but it is just one long layout. So the title header, the whole front report page is a title header. So mm -hmm. that's all that shows uh, on that front page. And then there's a regular header. And then um, the project overview is done in a leading subsummary part. So it's just a giant text box. Um, so I think I said it could be pages long, but really it can be probably one page long. Um, I could do an extended version, but I haven't. Okay, so, so in that case, because this is actually very similar to what mine looks like, so my section there, just in case, might be five pages long, but of course it collapses with the uh, proper setting. So you can just leave it really long. Right, yeah, every, um, every object here is sliding up and reducing the enclosed part um, so that uh, it can be dynamic. Um, and then the body, this is all the space I've, allowed the body so far, I probably, I don't think we're gonna go much bigger than that because if we're putting that much in one feature, it's probably too much. So um, I could go bigger, but so far this meets the maximum that we've done on the individual features. And the you know little bullet is just a literal image um, on there. And then the, um, the cost summary page is in a trailing grant summary part, so it's always at the end. Okay. So, hey, Beth, uh, what you've done is, is very impressive, especially um, 
the way you work the FileMaker built-in layout uh, production and uh, the amount of time. The one, and FileMaker, obviously the greatest software product ever made. Uh, <laughs> and it, it does do a, a, a good job with document production. Uh, every now and then over the years, we've found documents that are super duper complex. And you know some of your stuff might slip into that where we've gone out to Apple script uh, and my coding partner did something in scribe, which I assume sort of the same thing, uh, you know, taking it over to word, which is not as good as FileMaker, but it does a good job with document production handles widows and orphans, mm -hmm. uh, which takes me back to my desktop publishing days, uh, you know, widows <laughs> and orphans, <laughs> keeping, keeping the uh, header of a section, uh, you know, glued to the body of the text, breaking over pages really, really well. Uh -huh. You know, that all said, I, I, I like what you've done. Uh, and if you're ever feeling like, um, to Karen's question, um, you know, whether you were this other tech, Apple Script, uh, the Apple Script implementation for Microsoft Word, last I checked, which was recent, remarkably robust. Right, Very but you're playing Apple Script, right? So it would be um, Mac only? Uh, yeah, on, on, on the Mac side, Apple Script, and on the PC side, I can't speak too much directly. Um, although my coding partner, you know, fired up Scribe for a client that was PC based. And essentially, I think it's sort of the same concept is taking FileMaker and using technology to get the data beautifully organized in FileMaker, sorted and so forth, uh, taking that data content and bringing it into um, Word using Scribe on the PC. You could probably do it with PowerShell, but uh, mm -hmm. Scribe from 360 Works uh, seems to be the go-to uh, for FileMaker to Word on the on the Mac. It's free, it's Apple Script, it works great. Um, you know, and then you have a Word document that's breaking across pages beautifully. Right. Uh, yeah. And you know, style sheets, you'd want style sheets in there somewhere. Right. Uh, that should keep you busy. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, and uh, if I may, one other comment uh, for Teresa. The, the technology that you're shipping, uh, uh, what's your target? What's your minimum ver version of FileMaker? I know 18 and 19, uh, it's rock solid because the FM, you know, the Get is application version. Is that locked in at 18 or can it run for a client? Uh, who has a future upgrader to 18, 19. Do you have a minimum version specified? Um, I just, because I threw this file together in the last couple of days, um, it's just set at the 12 that's in there. I didn't make any changes to that. Yeah, I always wonder, and, and this is a little bit controversial. Um, you know, when we put out a file, the controversy is like, you know, should it only run in the last two versions or should it run? We have some clients, I will confess, we have clients on 19 and even some on 14. So sometimes we'll we'll ship stuff trying to kind of get the broadest possible adoption for the long term economic health of uh, everybody all in, in the ecosystem, including Claris. So um, I'm just wondering, with the tools and techniques that you're using, I'm, I'm just wondering if this would run in 16, 17, or is it using 18 only features? Uh, I don't think anything that I used was an 18 only, um, but I can do a little review and make sure be because it's mostly just calculated, you know, text um, okay. and nothing special. Uh, I don't think there's going to be an issue. I have 16 on my machine. I can run it through that and and make sure all the buttons still work and everything so if you have a client who hasn't yet upgraded to 18 the get application version just to get it so it defaults back so it's uh let's see the the fmp fmp 18 that was 18 and up so that calc you might tweak it so that it's uh defaults back to fmp only 17 mm -hmm. and below but once again i thought that was really uh very impressive everyone should attend the Pittsburgh user group. Yeah. Thank well, you. We, we think we are, so. We are the best group, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I already, yeah, everyone, yeah. Uh, sure, each one better than the next. Oh, yeah. coming up this week, by the way, public service announcement, although people won't hear it until it's too late. But uh, uh, you lucky people will know that tomorrow is San Francisco. 
uh, and Friday is LA with Rick Kalman and somebody else, Seed Code, someone, but Rick Kalman. So that should be interesting. Bring your questions. Okay, cool. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else have uh, one more thing? And if you need time to think about one more thing, I can move on to the wrap up announcements and stuff, which hearing silence, I will take that I should move on to the wrap up announcements and stuff. So let me go ahead and share. All right. Um, uh, so the, just the first announcement was just a reminder on some upcoming stuff for the Claris Engage Beyond. Be We'll try again, Claris Engage Beyond uh, events that are coming. Uh, I don't know uh, if everybody had a chance to see like the kickoff event that they had here it was back on the 25th of August, uh, but they have uh, two dates coming up here in September. Uh, this coming Tuesday, there's actually three different things happening. Uh, there's an idea to custom app workshop, uh, a panel discussion, uh, and then uh, finally, there's a, a meet and greet uh, networking event. Uh, and then on the 28th, there's a strategic growth, growth initiatives uh, with uh, Julie Sigfridigas and uh, Ryan McCann, uh, but that is a, a partner exclusive. So if you're a, a Claris partner, uh, you would receive a, an invite and be able to attend that. Uh, but you can learn more at the uh, link there for Engage. Uh, it has all of these listed, as well as some future ones that they don't exactly have uh, dates for. No registration has not opened. Uh, and then also there are links to view any of the events that have already been recorded uh, in case you happen to uh, you know, miss either of those uh, that have already happened. Uh, second one is just a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, at Cross, we've been doing some lunch and learns we did back in the spring. Uh, we took the summer off, uh, so uh, next week we will return uh, for what I am calling Todd Talks. Um, I can't officially call it that, but that's what I think about it in my head, uh, just talking about parameters and the different methods for passing parameters to uh, scripts. So if anybody wants to check that out, that'll be at noon on Saturday. Saturday. Noon on Wednesday. I don't know why I said Saturday. All right. Um, and then just the last announcement, I just like this slide. Um, if you're interested, we are on, we have a Slack channel as well as a LinkedIn group that if you like information, just uh, shoot me an email and I'll uh, let you know what's going on there. All right, uh, so for our survey last month, um, we had talked about uh, or asked what your plans were for Claris Engage Beyond. Uh, and it was pretty well split between people that were gonna focus on sessions that align with your interests and those that uh, want to look at sessions that help you improve your skill set where maybe uh, you need to learn a little bit more. Uh, and there's a few that are just going to say, I'm going to watch as many as possible. So, Interestingly enough, one of the questions that we asked last month was how you have used a web viewer. I think we've all found another use for a web viewer. Um, but that was, this would have been the perfect question to ask this month. But there you go. Um, as you can see, the overwhelming majority has added a map to a contacts layout, which is pretty much how you can tell um, when FileMaker or when that file was built in FileMaker is if it has a contact database and it has a map layout or a map on the layout, you know it was built in, was it FileMaker 8.5, I think, that introduced the web viewer? So you know that that's when it was built. So uh, but there's a few of the other things there that people are using web viewers for. Uh, and the last one, which is a topic near and dear to my heart, is I wanted to find out what roller coasters at Kennywood everybody loves to ride. And uh, you can see that the uh, classic wooden coasters, the Jackrabbit, Racer, and Thunderbolt were the top vote getters. I'm a little surprised that the Phantom's Revenge uh, wasn't the clear winner because that's my personal favorite, but there you go. Uh, and then there were a few that said, uh, there's no way I'm riding a roller coaster. I'm just there for the potato patch fries. So there you go. Okay, important dates. I uh, just want to point out, um, like this month, 
uh, because of some potential scheduling conflicts, we are going to move next month's meeting off of our regular first Wednesday of the month. And we will meet once again on the second Wednesday on October 13th. Um, of course, we are mentioned about the Claris Engage Beyond. Uh, again, there's the link if you want to check out any of the uh, information about the different sessions and stuff. And for those of you that are interested, uh, Free Guy finally arrives on Blu-ray on October 12th. So, all right. Uh, so next month, um, our next topic, uh, we're actually going to have uh, Dave Ramsey uh, is going to be joining us uh, virtually, even if we're able to meet in person, he's going to join us remotely and uh, give us a tour of both FM perception and FM comparison. So it should be a pretty good meeting. Uh, if you've never used either of those products or want to learn more about them and how they can help you in your FileMaker development, uh, that'll be the topic for next month. Um, it also marks our ninth anniversary, if you can believe that we've been meeting for nine years uh, next month. Uh, so if we are able to meet in person, there will be Dairy Queen ice cream cake. Uh, so hopefully that happens, fingers crossed. I'll see for those of you that are in New York and Virginia, I'm afraid you're going to have to run down to your own local Dairy Queen and you know, get a dilly bar or something, I guess. So. Or travel. Or travel. Bakery or... Square has that nice, so isn't that a Marriott right there at the Bakery Square? So I... come on down. Yeah. We'll so... have a party. All right. And then there will be a survey that will go out probably either tomorrow or Friday, uh, hopefully. So please fill it out and let us know what you liked and what you didn't and so we can make it better. So. So that is all I had for my one more thing. Oh, I did have one for thing. One more thing for you, Mr. Mueller. I was wondering if you heard about the big sale at the Lego store. I guess people were lined up for blocks. <laughs> hey, no, wait. <laughs> I've got a comment for you, though. Okay. To err is human. To blame it on someone else shows management potential. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might like that being in management over there and all, you know. I do like it. I like it. All right. Well, it's good to see you back with us, Paul. We've, you've been missed. I've tried to fill in the Thank void, you. but I don't know if I quite have your panache for the uh, one more thing joke, so. No, well, I think you do. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate the thought. All right. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, final comments, questions? Todd, something for you again. Okay. I enjoy a glass of wine each night for its health benefits. The other glasses are for my witty comebacks and flawless dance moves. <laughs> Sorry about that, Chief. <laughs> so go out and have a glass of wine tonight, you know, celebrate. All right. Well, uh, anybody have anything else? If not, we can I can keep and... this going, Todd, if you want to, <laughs> but I won't. I guess just let me, I guess, let me say just in closing, thanks again, uh, both to Teresa and Beth for yes, thank fantastic you. presentations. You're quite welcome. Yes, yes, thank you. They're very good. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us and spending a little bit of your Wednesday evening uh, gathered around your computer, because it's not like you didn't do that already all day today, probably. Uh, so thank you. And hopefully we'll see you all uh, next month.